Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today. Um, so we figured, and this came as a request from Israel and a couple of other people in the community, that before we continue having the AME sessions, it's probably useful to take a step back and kind of have a conversation as to what XR is and why we care and why you should even bother learning about it, right? Um, my name is Kendra. And this is this is me in a word, word cloud. This is everything that I am about, right? I am a program manager at Microsoft. I work with the mixed reality engineering team here um, to both. Um, so externally, I handle community engagement, things like this, and make sure that the things that we're building internally are relevant in the community and that we're, um, we're actually driving impact and trying to actually embed ourselves into the ecosystem to learn from the community and to share our knowledge with the community. Internally, I also work with the engineering team um, on a, um, in a PM role to support the team in delivering the products that we're working on. Uh, the things that I am passionate about are, um, Festus, you are sharing. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen again. Anyway, so the things that I am passionate about are um, anything that has to do with um, increasing the value that we, increasing the way that we can share the things that we build with the community, increasing the knowledge base of the African ecosystem as a whole. Um, and making sure that African developers get like the opportunity to stand on the same stage as every other person um, and compete equally um, on the same global footing. Um, so that's what I am. That's what I am. That's what I do. Um, but moving on to today's topic about extended reality. What is extended reality? In a nutshell, extended reality is anything that allows you experience your world in a bigger, more immersive way, right? Um, the term extended reality itself is used to cover all the technologies that do this, so AR, VR, MR. Um, and it basically means that you take computer-generated media, and I say media because it can be pictures, it can be text, it can be just sounds, um, and you interact with them from our real world um, so whether you interact with them in your real world, like with AR and MR, or you create a new experience, a new environment where you can interact with that um, media, which is where VR comes in. Um, so yeah, extended reality is a blanket term that covers all the immersive technologies, both present and future. And it refers to any technology that allows us combine real and virtual elements across different levels of interactivity. I will talk more about the levels of interactivity later. Um, so like I said, there are three different current um, available extended um, technology, extended reality technologies, and they are AR, VR, and XR, and MR. AR is basically taking those digital images, digital um, media um, content, and superimposing it on real world objects. Um, so basically think Snapchat filters, right? You look into a Snapchat filter, you see yourself, which is a real world object, and then you can see masks and hats and horns, I guess. And those are not, those are the digit, that's the digital superimposition on top of the real world objects. That's the most common use, I guess, the most widespread use of AR that I know. Um, and it's a, it's also the the most popular because all you need to consume AR like that is a device that has a camera and has the processing power to relay those images to you. So it's pretty low entry, low bar to um, to both create and to consume AR. Another good example of AR is Pokemon Go. I don't know if any of you got a chance to play Pokemon Go when it was all the rave in, I think, 2015. Um, that basically lets you catch um, their Pokemon characters planted in different parts of the world, and you can like catch them on your phone. Um, but yeah, 
Snapchat is basically the, the, the easiest way to understand AR. VR, on the other hand, is a computer-generated environment that requires you to um, view that environment outside your environment. So you wear a head-mounted device or um, a VR headset, and you can then, your entire field of vision is now surrounded by this computer-generated world, right? And it can be used in a lot of different ways. You can just use it to watch 360-degree movies. So imagine um, watching movies, and instead of your screen just being in front of you, no matter how large your screen is, in 2D, you are, like, in the movie, and you can look, and there's things happening behind you. There's, like, you feel more immersed in the movie. Or it can be used for, I think, um, the one of the most, I guess, popular users for VR is games. Um, where you can act, like interact. Imagine playing Call of Duty in VR, right? Where it's like you're holding a gun, you can see the people, you can move around, you feel like you're interacting with the environment. And it's just a different level of experience than watching something on the screen. Um, so, but because VR creates that whole world, it requires a lot more processing power than AR world. Um, so you need more specialized devices. You need a VR headset, or at the very least, you need um, like Google Cardboard, I guess, where you have to insert your phone they call them mobile driven headsets where the actual content is in your phone and then the headset just like shields your vision so that that is all you can see and that is all you're interacting with the difference is that um the kind of headset you use for vr kind of impacts the way you can interact with the environment so with the mobile driven headsets like an example you can most times just look around, right? There's not enough processing power on your phone to allow you actually interact with the thing. So mobile driven headsets is usually used for experiences that you just need to view. So like if you wanted to attend a concert in VR, you just need 360 degree video to be able to see everything that's happening and feel like part of the crowd. Um, but for more processing power, so like gaming or um, education and things like that, you generally go for the more advanced headsets. So you have the Windows Media Reality headsets like the Samsung Odyssey that you can plug into. Those ones generally, the headset it, it itself doesn't even have enough um, processing power. You need to plug them into um, a personal computer so you can borrow the processing power of the computer um, and use that. And then there's like the Oculus Quest, which is a standalone headset. It's kind of like really it's i think it's the most powerful of its kind so it's the most powerful standalone headsets but it's not it doesn't have as much power, uh, processor power as the ones that um require a pc to power them as well um but for standalone headsets it's definitely the best um yeah examples of ways you can use uh vr would be like i said gaming or if you needed to create an environment where um so imagine if you wanted to create a chemistry class where the students can be like a part of the chemical solution and they can just like move atoms or molecules around to form new compounds and you know you can get creative because that's the advantage of vr is that you can get creative with the environment because you have full control over the environment because you built it right um so yeah it's fully immersive but you don't it doesn't interact in any way with your real environment and that's vr now, mixed reality is the combination of both AR and VR. Mixed reality basically does what AR does, where it superimposes digital content on top of um, real world objects, but then it also gives you the power of VR when it comes to interacting with those digital objects. So as an example, um, what would I use as an example? Um, in AR, you can probably view like, you can look at your table and like through your phone view a what a glass um like i don't know a glass table would look like right in the middle of your of your sitting room but with mixed reality you can more than just view it you can turn it around you can you know shift it into places and see what it will fit like you can like try to manipulate the way it looks you can try to manipulate the way it fits in your environment so it, it allows you to actually interact with the holographic images that you're creating, um, which is the newest and most like evolved version of extended reality and allows you to do a lot more than you can do in either AR or VR. 
um, because then you can actually have um, like immersive learning experiences. Um, and it, it's, it's, I guess the drawback of that is because it's doing a lot more, it requires a lot more processing power, which is why you don't have as many uh, mixed reality devices as you have VR devices or AR compatible devices. Um, does that make sense with the differences between AR, VR, and MR? Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Yeah, it does. Fantastic. Yeah, it does. Um, okay. I guess the next question then would be, uh, yeah. How are how is XR being used in the world today? Like I said, entertainment is probably the earliest adopter of the technology because it's easy to um, to see use cases for um, for XR in entertainment. I mean, gaming is just like the first thing that comes to the top of your head. There's also um, like concerts, like I said. There's the film industry and just like what they can do with 360 degree um, vision if they knew their users can see in 360 degree and make more immersive movies. But then there's also retail. Retail, um, some application of XR in retail is imagine if you could try on things on, like if you're shopping online, like one of the drawbacks of shopping online, like you wanted to buy, I don't know, a shirt on Jumia is that you can't try it on, right? But if you had, if Jumia had like an AR app, you can try things before you buy them. Um, so that's like the most, the, the way I've seen it applied in re retail is mostly the try before you buy um, ideology. Training and development is another great, great application of XR because um, as you know, there's difference between when you read something and when you actually experience the thing, right? One of the applications I have seen was actually a startup in Nigeria, Quadran, um, and they built training environments for health and safety in oil companies. So a lot of oil companies, the, the kind of things that they train you for are like, what happens if a fire breaks out? What happens if, you know, but those are things that you can only tell the person. So if a fire breaks out, you go, you grab the fire thing, you sure you press here, you press here, you do this, right? And you hope to God that when that thing actually happens, they remember the thing that you told them, right? But in VR, they can actually experience what it's like for a fire to break out, right? That whole adrenaline rush, the whole, do you remember, like, they recreated, like, a scenario of what your office would look like. And it's like, do you remember where they can you, how, how, how much time does it take to get you, for you to get to the fire extinguisher? How much time do you get from there to the fire? Do you press the right buttons, right? So it's more immersive training. And your memory keeps that longer than something you read of a book or something you were told. Um, so that's, Training and development is like a great application for XR. Real estate is similar to retail in the sense that imagine if you are going to rent a house, especially in a place like Lagos, where it's just a nightmare. But then um, instead of going from house to house to house with agents, you can just stay in the comfort of your house and have like a VR walkthrough of the place where you can go from room to room. You can see, um, you can even like test like if you um, have like the digital representations of your furniture, you can try fitting your furniture into places to see how it would look at the in the finished result of the house. Um, for education, it's kind of the same thing with training and development. Design and prototyping is like imagine if you were trying to build a plane for um, Boeing, right? Actually, prototyping that is super expensive but if you could do that in 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 especially in mixed reality you can model out the plane and prototype without actually getting into the expense of actually building that and then people can give you feedback people can add their like adjustments and all of that can go into the plane before you actually start expensing materials and man hours on the plane um so yeah those are some there are a lot more applications of xr but those are like top of my head is that some um ways that i know that it's being used today the on the flip side the challenges that xr is having and why it is not yet as widespread as you would think considering all the benefits are one privacy so to be able to um to interact with um the digital contents the way you need to. The headset and the, the, the device that you're using needs a lot of information from you. It needs to know what you're looking at. It needs to know, you know, where you're placing things. It needs to know what your environment looks like. It needs to know what you, like your height, your, it needs 
some information from you and people are not yet comfortable as to what that means like where does that information live who has access to that so privacy is a concern that um, i've heard people express another um, concern is cost both the cost of development and the cost of implementing so on the development aspect to build for xr you need a pretty decent machine um, that can run all of your simulations that can run that can render the product without frustrating you completely um but then there's also the cost of implementation because like if you are going to sell um using the um the example i gave earlier of a company doing um health and safety training using virtual reality it means that they have to buy virtual reality headsets for them to be able to implement that training and imagine a company with like a thousand employees across 10 different states that starts to add up um, so yeah, the cost is a bit tricky for uh, for people. The next thing that I th personally think is a is a is a is a challenge is infrastructure. By infrastructure here, I mean just globally, right? Because the best kind of experiences are experiences you can share, right? If you build this amazing uh, social virtual platform, right, where people can through think house party, but virtual, like by VR, right? Where people can actually like come and hang out. For something like that to be successful, you need to have the people that all have like really good internet, they have lights, they have, you know, the, the, just the infrastructure of being able to share those experiences is, is something that is a challenge right now, especially in parts of the world like Nigeria. And then there's hardware, the hardware of the headsets themselves. For headsets to become widespread i believe that the design needs to be a little slicker a little more comfortable for people to wear long term um and we're not quite there yet the whole lens is pretty close uh but we're not quite there yet and so that's why so ideally you want to be able to just you know put your vr or ar mr glasses into like a your typical glasses case and put it in your purse so that if you're anywhere that requires air, you can just rip it out and plug it in and wear that right so the design needs to be a bit slicker a bit more everyday use-ish for it to be treated as an everyday use technology. Um, and then finally is adoption. And this is kind of like a summary of everything I just said, in the sense that for you to build a social, one of the key things about, again, experience is the best when they're shared. One of the key things about sharing is that you're only on the platform. It, it's, the platform is only useful to you if your friends are already on it, right? So imagine if on WhatsApp, as an example, you are the only person you know that is on WhatsApp you would uninstall that very quickly because it's not as useful to you, right? So the more people we need on it, the more people we should already have on it. It's a weird cart horse situation. But yeah, and for it to become widespread, a lot of people more to, need to adopt it, for them to adopt it, all these other challenges need to be addressed. And then this is the other question I get a lot, and that is, so I want to start building for XR, but I don't know what XR to build for. Um, should I build AR solutions? Should I build VR solutions? Should I build MR solutions? Um, and the, I guess the three starter questions, they, there are a lot more questions, but the three starter questions to answer before you start to build is one, how interactive do you want your experience to be? Do you want your users to be able to actually interact with the content, the digitally um, created content? because that is going to determine whether it can be AR. So as an example, if I want to build a, a jewelry store app and I want people to be able to try on jewelry before they buy it on the app, I don't need VR or even MR for that. AR is fine because they just need to be able to see themselves and see the jewelry, the way the jewelry looks on them, as uh, similar to the Snapchat filter, just a different application of it. Uh, same thing if I want to be able to so imagine a textbook, right? And I want when you point your camera on the textbook, I want or when you look through your XR device on the textbook, I want you to be able to see. So imagine if it's like the drawing of a skeleton, I want you to be able to see labels for like the femur and you know the clavicle and things like that. That is also a thing that you can do in AR. If, however, I need two people to be able to play chess long distance without being in the same room now that becomes a conversation for vr or mr because you need them to be able to manipulate 
the digital content that you're creating. So yeah, that's the first question is how interactive do you want your experience to be? The second question is, do people need to be aware of their environment while using your solution? So as an example, if I want um, to create a fashion gallery and I want people to be able to see different um, designs that I have created, I don't need them to be aware of the environment. I need them just looking at the environment I created is fine. However, if I want them to be able to, if I want them to put um, special anchors that show directions to a particular location, then it means that they need to be walking in the real world and then see those anchors to point them to the location that they need. Um, so like those are the kind of questions you ask yourself. Do you want to be interactive? Do you want people to be aware? Then is it a customer or consumer, is it a consumer or enterprise experience? Well, why this is important is because of costs. So if you want a lot of people to be able to use your platform, then it has to be on a technology that is available to a lot of people. So if you want, if for your platform to be, um, to reach maximum impact, you need like 100,000 people on it, then MR isn't a good fit because I don't even think they're up to 100,000 MR glasses in just production right now, right? Um, so you have to, those are the things, that how many people do you want to reach? How many people need to be on it? I, am I building for a company that requires just like maybe 10 devices for, their purposes or am I building a social network that requires a large number of people? So those are the kind of things that I would ask myself before going into what technology makes sense for me. So um, I want to give time for us to actually go through questions. I just wanted to cover what the basics and fundamentals of what ex um, extended reality is. Um, if you want to learn more, there actually is a course on Microsoft, Microsoft Learn around introduction to specifically mixed reality, but it also touches on um, AR and VR as well. Um, that I think that is a great place to start if you want to understand how to build or where to go from here on extended reality. And that is all from me. Questions? Okay, um, thank you very much, Kendra. Um, that was a really insightful session. Um, they, there have been some questions from the community and I'm going to be reading them out. So okay. after we did that, um, if there are still any more questions, anyone can turn and ask. So um, I'll be taking questions from the top. Sorry, Joe, I'll ask you for a second. Hello, can you yeah, hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, hello, okay. Kendra, this is Jafflet. Hey, Jafflet. Yeah, thank you very much once again. Sorry I joined a little late, had some issues I needed to fix. Thank you, thank you for your session. You covered a lot of things in your session. Um, so I don't know the questions we have already. If we need to just ask them, or we'll probably so Israel, go on. Israel is going to yeah, um, read out a list of questions, and then Ayabami has um, their hands up as well. So we're going to do the uh, the questions that we sent in ahead, and then we're going to start the um, live sessions, live questions with Ayabami. Okay, so um, Ayubami, your hand is raised and that's been noted. So you go after I've read all the questions. So the quest the first question we have here is, can I develop MR applications on Ubuntu? Absolutely, yes. Um, so depending on the kind of MR solutions you want to build, the my preferred way of building um, well, VR specifically is Unity, using the Unity gaming engine. And I know that that works on all Linux distributions. So, yes. Okay, so um, whoever asked that, I'm sure you've gotten your answer. Um, the second question is, um, how do you get started in XR as a beginner? Is there a clear path or set of milestones? So XR is not so different from learning any other technology. Um, it really depends. I think that X XR is by default an extension of the thing that you're already building, right? So you can build 
a you can build a an app for you can build an app for teaching people right um how to i don't know braid their hair right and then you can add an xr element to that and that can be anything from it depends on where your platform already lives it can be web vr it can be you know over um um the mobile ar or it can be vr right so all of that are elements you add on so the question then becomes what are what is the core thing that you're building and what are the skills that you need for that so as an example if you want to build vr games or vr game like solutions and i would say learn unity learn c sharp um if you are trying to incorporate ai i'd say learn python so it depends on what else that you're building the xr on top of does that make sense yeah yeah it does it does make sense um i think the person should get the clear picture now um so um this one is a series of questions from one person and it says how does one get into XR? The second question is, what programming language is needed? The third question is, does the field pay enough money? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and the fourth question is, how expensive is it to get into the field? Okay, so the first two about how to get into um, MR and XR and what programming language is needed is same as the question before. It's, it depends on what else you're building. Um, does the field pay enough money? I I believe that every field pays enough money if you know where to look. But also because XR is still very niche. Like it's still is a thing where the entire world is still trying to figure it out. Uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, everybody is still trying to figure out what they are doing with XR. So being able to build uh, X, uh, XR solutions is a sought after talent and skill. So if you're good, yes. But then again, that is true for anything. If you're good and you know where to look, then yes, it pays a lot of money. Okay, and great. how expensive it is to get into the field. Um, yeah. To get started, not too expensive, to be honest. Um, what you really need is a laptop or a computer that has the processing power to run whatever it is that you're trying to build. But then as you scale, it can start to get a lot expensive because you need it when you just start, it's easy to, you know, run it on a HoloLens emulator or, you know, other kind of emulators. But then at some point you need to be able to test this thing for yourself on a real device, which if you're building VR means getting a proper VR headset or you know getting a proper smartphone if you're doing AR and such and such so it's at your scale it starts to add up the cost yes um but to get started you can get started with whatever devices you currently have okay great um okay the question from the fourth person says how can we make xr more accessible to people in africa that's a great question and that is answering that question is a lot of what my job is so thank you for that. Um, more accessible is a tricky one. Um, there are different ways we can do it. One is even just the education of what XR is, is what we're currently doing, is building communities like your community to say these are the different ways that XR can be applicable in Africa and is to get people excited and even just knowledgeable about it. Um, another is to, um, and this is for companies that are building um, XR solutions and devices, mine included, and that is to start to see how we can create cost-effective devices, right, for people. And they are they are cost-effective devices depending on the level of interactivity you need, right? They are um, they the the mobile-driven headsets are tend to be a lot cheaper than the other ones. So it's I guess it's it's that's a difficult question to answer. And I guess the way to start is just through education, right? Education and so through building solutions that use XR. Um, so that people start to get used to XR in their just like everyday life. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Um, the, fourth, the fifth question here says, I wanted to know how I could start a business in XR. Mm. Another question. What's that? I did another tricky one. Um, not so much tricky as it is. So there's no different way to start a business in XR than there is a way to start a business in almost any technology, right? 
Um, like I said, XR is really just like building on innovation and creative, just adding a bit of innovation and creative to something you already do. So if I wanted to start, I think you, you're thinking about it the other way around. You don't want to start an XR business. You want to start a real estate business that is that XR can give you an edge and give you make you stand out from the crowd. You want to start you know, a gaming business, but XR makes your games more immersive. Like The XR business is not the way I would look at it. It's what, what problem are you trying to solve? And how can you use XR to make that more innovative and to make you more unique in that field? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think I learned from this also. Um, okay, so the next question is, also, can machine learning and AI be embedded into mixed reality? Absolutely. Definitely. Um, a huge part of... Um, of XR and just especially MR and AR is understanding the objects around, like understanding the environment you live in, right? And that's one great place that machine learning and computer vision can come in, right? Um, I believe personally that you can add AI. AI is kind of like XR in the sense that you can add it to anything to make it better and make it more intelligent. So short answer, yes. Yes, it can be added to XR. Okay, great, great. Um, the next one says, how is UI UX design factored into mixed reality and artificial uh, augmented reality? Mm, that is a great question. That is a great question because when you're building solutions that primarily um, uh, factor in human interaction with a thing, UI at UX becomes all the more important, right? Um, if you build a website that has bad UX, Somebody can try to ignore the UX and just get to the part where they want to shop, right? But when the entire solution is user interaction, then that becomes super important. Um, and building design for VR and um, for XR as a whole is different from building from for everything else um, because you have to think about the user in 3D as opposed to 2D with like when you're building mobile and web um, based apps. So it does, I, I, that's a whole other conversation. We can probably have like an AME specifically for XR design. Um, but yes, it, it's a huge part of building for XR. Okay, so I think we need to take note of that and work on something similar in our future AMA sessions. So um, the next question we have is, where does user interface design comes in and what are the things to take into consideration when designing for extended reality? Yeah, so that's similar to the last question. Um, so it, part of designing for, like I know that some people were, while building for extended reality, you know, they actually make like 3D, like physical representations of the things that you're trying to build just to help them think properly around how users can interact with it, right? There's a lot that goes into designing for extended reality. Um, if, you're just, if you're just starting out, I would say use the, an example of something you can use is the MR2 kits, MRTK, um, because it helps you supply things that you don't want to have to learn to build, like buttons, how to handle inputs from the users. Um, how to handle input routing, how to what how to the feedback from when the user presses a button or clicks a thing. Um MRTK handles all of that for you. Um so yeah, there's there's a lot, like I said, we can hold a, a whole AMA around um XR design. There's a lot that goes into just thinking around 3D interaction and shared 3D interaction for that matter. Okay, I think so many people's interest are around these areas, so maybe we should consider doing something like that in our next AMA session. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question, um, I think you've answered it already. It says, um, what is extended reality and how does it benefit businesses? In what ways can the technology be applied to solve business problems, especially businesses, emerging markets, especially emerging markets such as we have in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. I want to assume, I want to believe that the what is extended reality part I've already answered, um, and also how businesses can apply it. For specifically for emerging markets in Africa, if you're building XR in Africa, I would say start relatively small. Like start from surfaces that you know that your market has access to. Like if I wanted to build XR in Africa, I would start with web VR or um, 
AR that you can um, handle on your phone or like like be aware of your market. Again, that comes to the thing where I was talking about how to choose what reality you're building for. Um, but like if you have to build in Africa, but even in Africa, there, there are enterprise companies that don't mind paying um, a few hundred or a few thousand bucks for proper headsets if you give them what they want. So like if you're, if you're trying to build for, I guess, Lafarge, if you wanted to build health and safety for Lafarge, you don't have to worry about the cost as much because you know they can afford if you build a good solution. So it really depends on understanding your market and understanding who you plan to, who your users, who the users of your experience are going to be, and then choosing accordingly. Any other questions, Rachel? Okay, um, I think we lost Israel. Oh, so, um, that is not sorry, as a mute. But um, okay. we have more questions. And the next one here is, is how can how can MR enthusiasts in Nigeria have access to holiness devices for Microsoft, so they can <laughs> test out, <laughs> so they can test oh. out their fields. Unity input simulators and HoloLens simulators help out, but they are still limited mm -hmm. in their capabilities. Um, I feel like this question is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> okay, um, let's just say that that is something that I am working on and leave it at that. Okay, great, great. That's great news to hear for <laughs> myself personally. Okay. <laughs> So the last one here says, can one start learning AR development without having AR compliant devices? Yes. So like I said, you can start building uh, because you have emulators that let you test a lot of these things, right? So you can start building. And AR compliant devices, to be honest, a lot of smartphones will let you do at least the most basic AR. Um, because think about it, if you can do Snapchat on your phone, you're already doing AR. Um, so it's not as it's not as um, as hard to access as VR and XMR. But even that said, yes, you can start to build for AR before you have um, a device to test it on. And I would suggest that you do that. And then when you get to the point where you need to test it, you and you absolutely need a device, you can just like get somebody's phone if your phone is not powerful enough to just test run and move on. But don't let that be the thing that stops you from starting. I think when I actually started, my device was not compatible. So, um, okay, those are all the questions we have from the form. Um, Great. I think Ayobami has hands raised. Yes, so we have Ayobami, Ayobami and then we have Danilola. But yeah. Ayobami had his hands raised first, so. Ayobami, you have a question? You can unmute and ask your question. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi, Bami. Okay. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for such um, explanation in respect to extended reality. Um, fortunately, I uh, let me know some newbie, but um, I really do not know much about this until you give this comprehensive um, exposition. So uh, while you were making your exposition, I got to remember a situation I had one time. Um, so I'm a Red Cross uh, member, and um, there was this um, interactive um, session we had one time. It was a uh, it was a live session for um, CPR training. Um, mm -hmm. That's the cardiopulmonary resuscitation training. So it was a live interactive session where you get to. It was played, uh, made in a gameplay kind of format. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I want to just make reference to for that one, have the all. Um, um, what's the gadget called now? Where you get to put it on your eyes in order to have that it was just a basic um screen 
from the system we were using that brought mm -hmm. out um, interaction and it was live and it was um, very intense. It was almost as if we were in a real life setting. So is that also extended reality or something else entirely? Oh, that's a good question. Also, great to hear that you're a Red Cross. I, I was a Red Cross for most of my teenage years. Um, but that, so in its in its um more technical terms, that isn't extended reality because it's in two D, right? And one of the core, like I guess, um, the things about um extended reality is that you need to be able to manipulate or like bring. 3D experiences and just digital experiences into your world or go into that world. Um, but honestly and truthfully, if you feel like it extended the way that you perceive the reality, then I guess in its most basic form, then yes, it's XR. Because these days people are trying to look at XR as more than just like visual. I know people are creating like, trying to create like XR sounds. Um, so really, yeah. truly, technology evolves. So if you feel like, and the idea behind XR is just giving you more to your reality. And if you feel like it did that, then hey, sure. OK, Ayumami, Ayuma, does that answer your question? I cleared. Thank you so much. At least that made a good exposition to it. Thank you, Ayumami. Daniel, I have a question. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, first off, let me say the presentation was fantastic, short and concise. So my question is this. Um, it's, it's in regards to the learning path. Uh, so mm -hmm. not much has been said about 3D modeling. So mm -hmm. is it... Um, uh, okay, let me, let me try to paint a scenario for people trying to get started. Uh, do they need to uh, know how to uh, model in 3D? I know there are stores where they can get the 3D assets okay. from yeah. like um, the Unity store and the like. But um, let's say what I'm trying to, I can't find it. Do you mm. understand? Are there, are, there, are there platforms where maybe they can do some sort of customization. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If yeah, I do. Puts together a design without actually learning 3D modeling. Hmm, that's a good question. So Unity, as an example, learn, makes basic. But the thing is that if you want more complex, more complex assets, you need to either learn 3D modeling or you need to have a 3D modeler on your team. But if you want just basic, um, you want to just manipulate either an asset you've, you've already added to your um, added to your project, you want to just be able to tweak it a bit or you just want to create like placeholder, um, placeholder assets when uh, buying the time where you can actually fill it in with proper things. You just want like that. That level of basic assets, you can do that yourself on Unity, to be honest. Unity makes it super easy to add assets. Um, the prefabs are extensive and it's easy to manipulate, or it's not difficult to manipulate. It's probably a better way to say that. Um, and then, honestly and truly, I think that if you're getting serious with building those kind of things, it's probably worth it to take just like one course in. Coursera or Udemy or Udacity on 3D modeling using Blender. Blender is a free software. You can use that to just test different things. Um, but yes, I, I feel like you can create those basic placeholder assets yourself. But I also feel like you want to create more because the truth is that if you're creating um, extended reality environments, one of the key, back to the user experience things, one of the key things is that the, the user needs to be able to believe what you're seeing. It needs to look real to them. It needs to feel like real to them, meaning your assets need to be high quality. So I would always recommend having a 3D modeler on your team or like buying assets from the store or outsourcing, outsourcing that part. But yes, to answer your question in a concise way, you can create like basic assets yourself on the store or take a course to learn how to create a bit more complex assets. 
Okay. Using That's using fine. Unity and Blender. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much, Kendra. That was a really beautiful thing. And I learned a whole lot from that. Um, Damlola, I believe your question has been answered. Sorry, I didn't. Yes, uh, yes, it has. Yes, it has. Okay, okay, great. So um, does anyone have any other question before we let Kendra go? Count down three, two, one. Greg has okay, a question. Um, thank you so much. Hello. Hi, Greg. Hello. Yeah. yeah, hello, yeah. So I was going to ask a question about having headsets available, so I'll be waiting for a response for that. So I want to ask, um, what opportunities does Microsoft have for UX design as well as experience in designing for mixed reality and experience using MRSK. Funny you should ask, because there's a job opening available right now for a UX designer at Microsoft um, for the MR team we have here in Lagos. So like as the MR team grows, those opportunities will grow as well. We're currently trying to hire three different designers, um, one uh, two technical designers and one UX um, designer slash researcher. So obviously those those um, opportunities exist and will continue um, coming as the as the as the team grows. Okay, so where can I find the alternative opportunity for you at Zena Research? I didn't see um, it on the website. I'll post it. I'll post it on the chat once we're done with this. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. So, any other questions? Any other questions? Hello, any other question? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kendra. This was a really, really insightful session. And we are glad you could join us today from your busy schedule. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. We are really, really grateful. Thank you. It was my pleasure. This was fun. Um, I'm always um, Jafflet, Israel, Olamide, know how to reach me. If you have any questions after this, still send them my way. I'll do my best to answer. Um, also, if you have any thoughts as to what you want this EMAs to be on for the next one. The next one, I'm not yet sure when it's going to be considering it's December. Um, but if you have any topics that you want us to explore, um, me and my team are always happy to host one of this session. So please send those recommendations over to Israel and he'll make sure it gets to me. Thank you guys so much for attending and making these calls and for submitting your questions. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Kendra. Um, we'll have the links for this, both for the recording in case you need to play back and for the resources Kendra posted. Um, in our chat, and also we'll have a pool for you to suggest the next topic you want for the AMA sessions. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure we all learned a lot. And just before we go, I just want to say thank you.